Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV. And uh, it's been a couple of days, and there's another break before I'm back on Sunday with Rana Mitter. But after Rana Mitter's show, I think it's 14 days straight. You're going to have to put up with me because we go straight into a series of shows about the various different kind of female heroes of World War II. Then that morphs into Herc and Forest Week. So uh, enjoy the break of me because it gets very intensive soon. But we're back talking about the Sino Japanese War. This time we're looking at the aviation aspect, and it's our second show about the Flying Tigers. But this time, from a slightly different point of view, because Aries Lee presented very much the kind of historiography view uh, of a Chinese American, how she perceived it, how the world perceived um, the, the volunteers outside of China uh, and in history, the movies, things like that. But now we're looking at the Flying Tigers and also particularly the aspect of the ones that were shot down. My guest, Daniel Jackson, earned a military history degree. He is also a serving U.S. Army, Air, uh, US Air Force. I always say U.S. Army Air Force because I'm stuck in World War II, a U.S. Air Force pilot. And his website, Forgotten Squadron, is in the description below. And the book that we're talking about today, Fallen Tigers, again, the link to purchasing it is in the description below. If you are new to World War II TV, please don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to click the no bell so you get the notifications and consider becoming a patron and or and or a channel member. Without further ado, I'm going to bring Daniel in. So good afternoon, Daniel. How are you today? Doing well, Paul. Thanks for having me. So Flying Tigers, it's, you know, as we've discussed already, it's one of those aspects of the Sino-Japanese War that we have known about for a long time. A lot of it really wasn't talked about in the Western world, but when a, when a su subject gets a John Wayne movie, it kind of becomes international. And that's something that happened with the Flying Tigers. And we have these classic books, the Robert Scott book written in, I think, 45. We have these other aspects there. But for someone like yourself, you know, who's, who's in the current military, what was it about this story that you wanted to go back and examine? Did you think perhaps the previous books weren't, weren't very nuanced? What, what, why did you get interested in this aspect of history? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I actually came out almost accidentally where um, I was a history major at the Air Force Academy and had the opportunity to meet some of these veterans uh, who actually flew in this war and not coming from a military family myself, I didn't have the sort of uh, built-in mentorship that a lot of my peers had in, in coming from military families. And a lot of these veterans uh, kind of took me under their wing, if you will, and uh, took it upon themselves to mentor me through my career. And uh, one of the interesting things, it, it gave me this uh, feeling of responsibility to pass on their stories, which were by and large not present in, in the narrative. But a lot of them had experienced this what seemed like an incredible experience uh, in China that was outside the standard narrative of the, the Flying Tigers, the American Volunteer Group, as we think of them, um, that the more that I learned about it, the more I realized there's this whole unexplored side of the war. Uh, and so that's kind of the, the angle that I entered it in. Well, brilliant. And um, as we've been discussing with other guests like Richard Frank and 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 and, and uh, Seje and what have you, is that it is a very very complicated war. On the surface, it's two nations uh, at combat from either 1937 or 1931, depending on your point of view. But then the you know, the U.S. get involved, British, Australians, Commonwealth forces get involved, and there are many layers to it. And as we were talking before going live, there it then morphs into another whole set of wars and combat that happened after the end of world war ii and and us's relationship in the, in southeast asia generally as the british and commonwealth relationships yeah, it's a very complicated subject but today we're going to talk about this aspect of the tigers that were shot down you've come on with a powerpoint i'm going to hand it over to you to take the presentation on but folks we will do questions again at the end of today i think a lot of the questions you'll have about about the subject will kind of be answered as we go along, but we'll do it. We'll do a Q&A at the end. But at, at the moment, I'm going to hand over to Daniel to take us through this this presentation. So over to you, Daniel. Thanks. Yeah, a lot of this, uh, what we're going to talk about today is uh, from my most recent book, Fallen Tigers, which specifically looks at the experiences of airmen that were declared missing at some point during World War II in China. And these are airmen that are actually based in China that then go on combat missions uh, from those bases and are reported missing and uh, kind of what happens to them, uh, which was my curiosity going into it and something that a lot of the folks that I knew personally had had lived through. And there were lots of popular narratives, but it was really interesting kind of diving into the truth of that. Uh, right off the bat, talking about my background and kind of the perspective that I take into this, I'm an active duty Air Force officer uh, I grew up in Colorado. I went to the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs for my undergrad, where I got a degree in history, um, became a pilot uh, in Special Operations Command, uh, 
uh, flying U-28s, deploying all over the world, and then uh, eventually becoming a combat aviation advisor, which was a really unique uh, job where essentially my role was to go to allied countries all over the world and uh, essentially help their air forces uh, with whatever operational or tactical problems they were working with to kind of uh, advance whatever the shared uh, goals were between the United States and that country. You can see in the top left corner there is from my most recent deployment to the Philippines working with the, the Philippine Air Force. And so uh, this whole concept of um, multilateral efforts, of alliances, of cooperation, of, of these intercultural reactions uh, and interactions are very interesting to me. Um, I've also been very lucky in, in being able to have uh, traveled to China many times. You can see in the lower left corner is me standing with a uh, World War II veteran from China, Mr. Pei Hai Ching, who actually uh, rescued an American airman during the war, uh, getting to learn their perspectives. I minored in Chinese at the Air Force Academy, which was completely by uh, happenstance. I did not choose that. They chose me. Uh, but it ended up fusing with this area of research really nicely. Uh, and so being able to bring in that perspective to something that, at least in the English language literature, is typically uh, seen just through an American lens. Um, and then finally, actually getting to uh, operationalize this research. And that central picture uh, is a picture of me and a team from the uh, Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency in, in uh, Northwest Thailand, uh, where we were actually at the crash site of a China-based P-51 Mustang that we found the wreckage of uh, back in 2018 and 2019. Um, and so being able to actually take uh, archival research and fuse it with uh, research from other countries, in this case, Thailand, and actually find some of these guys that have been out there, you know, for 70 plus years and start the process of bringing them home. So we'll talk about uh, all of these things to some extent. Um, I know that you've covered a lot of the background of the Second Sino-Japanese War, but what I want to do is kind of lead up to how the air power aspect plays into it and the importance of uh, the flying tigers and, and what exactly that even means. Uh, this is a very famous picture from Shanghai. Uh, obviously, the Japanese as an imperial power had made a big deal out of, out of air power because it is the mark of modernity, right, to a large extent. So they'd put a lot of, of effort into modernizing their air force, which was a real shock to the United States at the beginning of the war. But what's really interesting is from 1937 on, they're, they're using air power pretty persistently in China. And so the shock that the United States has in 1941 when we suddenly encounter it is, is uh, I mean, we were basically just willfully ignorant for the better part of, of four years, uh, which is interesting. But you have this whole lead up from 1937 with the Marco Polo Bridge incident. You know, uh, prior to that, the Japanese had already taken over Manchuria. There's a lot of internal discourse in China as to how to respond to these um, land grabs by the Japanese. There's China is not a united uh, polity at that time. They do not have one uh, central overarching government. It's very much all these warlords. There's a lot of coalitions. Uh, you have Chiang Kai-shek and his nationalists, which are trying to knit this together. But at the same time, you have a large communist movement under Mao Zedong that is gaining steam. And so China at this point is very fractured, which really lends itself to this Japanese steamroll that happens, especially in the Northeast. Uh, from Marco Polo Bridge, they capture Bay Ping uh, about a month later and then just roll across the North China Plains. Uh, it turns into this advance and a lot of urban combat, which I know uh, Peter Harmson probably talked about um, <clears throat> through Shanghai and uh, Nanjing up to Wuhan. Uh, modern Wuhan, Hanko, and the Tri-Cities area at the time, and just eviscerates uh, what it are all of the power centers of China. You know, this is all of their industry. This is their, their banking system. This is the majority of their population um, is now under Japanese occupation by the time we get to late 1938. And uh, it really keeps going until you can see there the Battle of Changsha in uh, September of 1939, uh, when the thing finally bogs down in a stalemate, the, the Chinese um, under Shuayua, 
kind of devised this, this ingenious tactic of luring the Japanese into the town and then cutting their supply lines. Um, and it works, you know, the thing bogs down into stalemate and now there is no movement on the ground essentially until really until 1944, uh, things are pretty stuck. And so the Japanese solution to this is to deploy their air power. And you can see by the time we get to this point, uh, you have the Japanese controlling essentially all of the ports, most of the coast, most of the uh, industrialized areas and the large cities, uh, which has essentially cut off China from the world, which is how we get to the point where they build the Burma Road uh, to, to keep this lifeline going. Um, but you also have the, the Japanese just unable to advance anymore. And so from 1940 onward, there's this big effort to try and bomb the Chinese into submission, to deploy overwhelming air power to break the Chinese will and kind of force them into some sort of settlement with Japan. And you have these massive air raids of sometimes hundreds of bombers uh, targeting Chongqing and other uh, um, free China uh, centers to uh, bring about this, you know, the Japanese objective of, of uh, conquest of China. And there is a Chinese air force that has kind of a hodgepodge of equipment at the time, but uh, it, it fares poorly. And especially in August of 1940, when the Japanese roll out their new A6M uh, type zero carrier fighter, uh, it, you know, the Japanese are just able to completely take over air supremacy in China. In that first combat, they shoot down something like uh, 13 Chinese aircraft with zero losses. And I think it was actually more than that, but I don't have the number right in front of me. Uh, it's just completely lopsided. The, the Chinese are completely powerless. And in fact, what's left of the Chinese Air Force is withdrawn from combat just to keep like a core of experienced pilots alive uh, to hopefully uh, be able to fight back at some point. So at this point, from August of 1940 onward, the Japanese are just able to bomb without opposition, just fly over in the middle of the day, drop bombs on population centers, and, and the Chinese are completely powerless to do anything about it. Uh, this is from a, a nationalist soldier that I interviewed, and you, you can see the sense of hopelessness uh, that's expressed in this quote, like, there's nothing that they can do about this. They have no weapons to fight back against this Japanese air supremacy. Now, uh, Claire Chenault is uh, an interesting character that is present through all of this from uh, 1937 onward. Uh, kind of this cantankerous uh, old man who is sort of drummed out of the Army Air Forces, forced into an early retirement because he had bad hearing and bad health as a, <laughs> as a captain. Um, goes to China, uh, calls himself a colonel for the, the, uh, and the Chinese do too, even though the, uh, the, the head shed knows the, the truth about him for the sake of his legitimacy as an advisor. Uh, but the way that he's approaching this problem is very different than his peers in the, the U S army air forces at the time, the U S army air corps at the time, uh, which is from the perspective of the bombers unstoppable. This is actually kind of the reverse situation, right? The Japanese are employing what the bomber mafia in the United States uh, wants to employ, which is this unopposed daylight bombing to crush the enemy's will, right? And Chanel has always been kind of opposed to that, where he thinks that with the proper intelligence, you can actually put up an effective defense with fighter aircraft. And so China actually gives him his chance to, um, to put that to the test uh, eventually. You know, he uh, provides some advice early on. And in fact, uh, during the Battle of Nanjing, uh, sets up this defense net around Nanjing that reports on Japanese aircraft incoming. So he's able to position the Chinese fighters. And even though the Chinese fighters, even at this point in the war, are technologically outclassed, uh, they're able to shoot down. They, they claim like 54 Japanese planes in three days. Very effective to the point where the Japanese end up uh, not being able to send undefended bombers. They have to send a bunch of fighter aircraft as well. And the Japanese are still able to seize air superiority because they're able to put up that that uh, fighter defense. But the point is well made at this point that, oh, wow, this is effective. And in fact, even after the Chinese lose air supremacy and the Japanese are basically running over the country unopposed, this network continues to proliferate and build throughout the country so that uh, 
people can evacuate as the Japanese are coming in and at least save lives prior to these big air raids. But it's this interesting prep work and this uh, building of this infrastructure, this intelligence infrastructure throughout the entire country, including into Japanese occupied territory, that kind of lays the groundwork for Chanel's later success with the 14th Air Force. And, and just to, to interrupt, I mean, th- we're talking about an idea, uh, you know, a, a, a combined air defense system. And we're talking about something akin to what the British had in 1940 defending England, where the press was all about the fighters, but actually it's just as much the Royal Observer Corps and the, the, the centralized uh, defense system and the, and the plotting tables, and things like that. And so you're saying that in a sense that Chenault is, 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 is looking at the, the Chinese Japanese situation from this all encompassing way. Whereas I think the world thinks of him as just, you know, saddling up, I know you're going to get this, they're saddling up some old fighters and going over there and just, you know, going up and shooting down aircraft. And there's obviously clearly a lot more to it than that. Yeah, uh, probably one of the hardest things for a pilot to admit is that flying the aircraft is probably the easiest part of an Air Force. Uh, You know, all the other parts, having an operational system, plugging it into... Uh, intelligence and uh, strategic goals and like an operational construct and also the infrastructure that's required, including airfields, bomb dumps, fuel, um, the maintenance that's required for the machines. Those are the hard parts of having an Air Force. Actually flying the plane is the easiest part. Uh, And so when you reduce Chenault to just a fighter tactician, uh, you're really taking away the most important parts, which are his building of a system Uh, and not only a system in, in this very uh, um, just kind of cold calculated sense, but a system that works cross culturally, uh, which is very unique. And in fact, if you, one of the unique things about Chenault is his ability to work cross culturally where other allied commanders had a lot of trouble with this. You look at Stilwell, and his relations with the Chinese leaders is very fraught. He has a lot of trouble working in a Chinese uh, context. He has a lot of trouble taking away or, um, you know, putting his American perspective to the side and trying to understand things through a Chinese lens. He sees a lot of corruption and inefficiencies and um, has a lot of trouble uh, empathizing with his allies. In other words, there's a lot of judgment and, and very little empathy. And so not only is it a system, but it's a cross-cultural system. And so that's where you get this uniqueness of, of Chenault. Chenault certainly had his faults, uh, but uh, those in particular were his big strengths. And Chenault is actually uh, sent to the United States by Chiang Kai-shek. I think he's given a lot of credit that might be undue in, in formulating the plan for the American Volunteer Group. And it ends up being a much more collaborative effort from the very beginning. You know, he's sent over there with Wang Shuming, who's this uh, Chinese Air Force general, he sent over there to plug in with uh, T.V. Sung, uh, the Generalissimo's brother-in-law, who's already been doing this ongoing uh, lobbying effort. Uh, And so he's kind of just the technical expertise, if you will, in an ongoing effort. Uh, And it's really to buy time for China to rebuild its Air Force by putting in some uh, unilateral American air power in the form of both planes and men uh, to create some space, to push back the Japanese, uh, contest the aerial domain again, and and give China the room to actually rebuild its air force itself. Uh, And what's fascinating is that this is happening against the backdrop of an America that, uh, you know, it's it's interesting, some of the continuities here. America believes in this uh, open markets and investment in China, and is actually really concerned with the fact that that Japan is making it into this sphere of influence that America is being forced out of. And so America is very concerned with keeping China open uh, to American trade. And so they've been uh, piling on different things like sanctions and a lot of tools that we see used today uh, that is actually escalating this system. And so allowing this covert American intervention via the American volunteer group, um, which has continuities through uh, the Central Intelligence Agency and Air America into the Cold War. And in fact, Chenault, uh, his post-war project, Civil Air Transport, CAT, becomes Air America. So when we talk about continuities, it's not just conceptual, like the same people are um, 
bridging these uh, these ideas across time and space. Um, and so it's it's really escalatory policy. It, it is interesting to then recontextualize Pearl Harbor uh, when you look back at these escalatory tit for tat measures between Japan and the United States over China and see that like maybe for the American public, but definitely not for the American government or the U S military, did this happen in a vacuum, you know, and out of the blue. Um, but what the, the ABG are able to do in, in brief, and I really don't want to get too much into them specifically is that they recontest the aerial domain and, and they make it so that Japan has to, actually vie for the airspace again. And all of the, the the comfort that Japan had built in being able to go unopposed is just totally robbed from them now. Now they have to fight their way into Kunming and Chongqing and other airspaces over free China. Uh, and, and so it's very effective as a morale tool for the Chinese, which is a big goal of American policy in China throughout the war is keeping China in the war. And so uh, once again, when you compare policy propositions from like Stilwell, who had this very linear view of what he wanted to do in China, which is we're going to retake Burma, then we're going to push into central China, and then from there we'll push out to the coast and build bases. And he's got this very linear, and his campaign makes sense, right, uh, from that linear military perspective. But it also means that some areas of, of China that have been occupied already for four years are not going to see an allied soldier for probably four more years. Uh, and so from the perspective of trying to keep China in the fight now, uh, you know, within one year or two years, you have uh, airplanes ranging over all of China, recontesting this area that's been occupied for so long and showing people that that this isn't over, that Japan hasn't won, even though they've been kind of isolated from that fight for years now. This is another uh, Chinese veteran that I had the, the opportunity to interview who's an intelligence officer in the Nationalist Army, and uh, just stressing the value to the Chinese of that recontested aerial domain that for years and years and years, they couldn't do anything about the Japanese just pummeling them. And now the American airplanes come in and now this is a fight again. And one of the interesting things about this research that we'll get into here is that everybody ends up, and I, I do mean everybody to some extent, it really feels like that looking at the research gets involved with that. This is not just the, the airplanes themselves. Um, so this particular book, uh, what I wanted to look at was there's a lot of anecdotal stuff about China. And in fact, that's one of the things that really bothers me about the history of this theater is it's mostly anecdotal and it's very politicized and very partisan. You're a fan of Stilwell or you're a fan of Chenault. You're a fan of Mao or you're a fan of Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, and there's... Um, you're reading the biography of a fighter ace. Um, it's all very personal and very rare is it to take a step back and, and ask yourself, what is the big picture? And in fact, um, I, I'd commend you. You're really bringing on a lot of the very few authors that are, are offering that bigger perspective during uh, this series of shows. Uh, so I, I think that's a good thing. Uh, what I wanted to do was I wanted to take a step back and look at the air war through the through more of a systemic lens and and be like, what is the net effect? What is the big picture of what's going on? I wanted to take these really interesting anecdotal stories and figure out, like, where do these sit in context? Because uh, one of the interesting things that I, I found was that, you know, when we think of the flying tigers and we think of the uh, war in China from the American perspective, it is mostly an air war. We think of dogfights. Uh, against these uh, Japanese bombers and fighters that are attacking Chinese cities. But what's really interesting is you can see when uh, I databased all of the 680 aircraft that were lost on combat missions in China, and most of them actually fell to enemy surface fire. Uh, enemy anti-aircraft fire and small arms fire during ground attack missions was the most dangerous thing for American aircraft in China, which shows the different nature of what's actually going on. Yes, there is dogfighting. You can see enemy aircraft is a, is a strong number two for taking down American planes on that slide. But, uh, you know, these American planes are attacking Japanese ground targets. They're supporting Chinese troops, Chinese guerrillas, attacking uh, Japanese targets deep behind the lines, if you will. And so the actual 
most dangerous thing that they're encountering is that anti-aircraft fire and that surface fire during those sorts of attacks. Uh, you can see that weather plays a big role here. You know, this is a time before a lot of instrumentation to be able to let down through the weather. Um, and so weather is actually a big cause of loss. Uh, accidents, uh, you know, there's still aircraft that we don't know what happened all, the years, all these years later. Navigation error, malfunction, friendly fire, uh, which fortunately wasn't a huge issue in these losses. Another interesting thing is when we think about this theater, we tend to think about the P-40 Warhawk as kind of the exemplar aircraft. You'll notice on the cover of my book, though, that there's a P-51 there. Uh, and that was an intentional choice because it turns out the P-51 was the most uh, lost airplane in the China air war. Uh, more P-51s were lost than any other aircraft. And another interesting thing is that the P-51, even though it has this reputation as the wonder fighter of World War II, ends up being a pretty crappy ground attack aircraft. Uh, and by that, I mean, it was just very vulnerable to ground fire. And if, even compared to, there's a, I did a comparison between one squadron that decided to hold on to its P-40s. And everybody's like, you guys are crazy. But they were primarily doing uh, close air support for the Chinese armies in southwest China. And what's really interesting is I compared them to a P-51 unit that was doing the same kind of work. And the P-51 unit was losing almost three times as many airplanes per hundred ground attack sorties as the P-40 unit was. Because that P-40 has that distinctive jaw at the front, mm -hmm. right, that those shark teeth look so appropriate on. That's where all the uh, coolant lines are running through and everything. Uh, because it's a, a liquid-cooled aircraft, a liquid-cooled engine on that aircraft. The P-51 has that scoop underneath the belly. And what's interesting then is those oil lines and the coolant lines run the entire length of the underside of the aircraft. If you're going to take out the coolant on a P-40, you're going to have to shoot at it from a front aspect, meaning that it's coming at you and shooting at you too, most likely. If uh, With a P-51, after that thing flies over, you could stand up and shoot at it from any angle, and you just hit it in the bottom and ever one of those lines and two minutes later his engine is going to seize and that guy's going to have to bail out um so it was really interesting looking at the data and kind of demystifying some of those uh legends if you will that uh yeah the, the p-40 was very prevalent in this war and you can you can still see it there as a strong second for the number lost this was also very clearly a war of fighters and fighter bombers not you know big bombers like over in europe um but uh, it's really interesting to see where these airplanes are effective um, and what domain. Uh, I think the biggest revelation, though, is just what happened to the airmen themselves. Uh, and as you can see here, this is missing as in still declared missing now. We don't know what happened to them. Uh, so killed and missing, they're, they're dead, uh, a little over 50 percent. What's interesting is this is very much the same as the uh, percentages that we see over Western Europe, for example. Uh, about half don't make it out. That makes sense. They're going down in a war, usually uh, ground fire, enemy aircraft. Somebody's trying to kill you. Turns out that's not conducive towards your you know, uh, longevity. Uh, what's really interesting, though, is if you look at airmen who go down in Western Europe, uh, we have a lot of romantic notions about French resistance, uh, Belgian resistance, Dutch resistance. And there's a lot of heroism there for sure. But what's interesting is when you look at it systemically, if you went down in these areas, you had about a 20 to 25% chance of making it back to allied control with the help of these resistance organizations. Uh, everybody else was ending up in a German prison camp. In China, what's really interesting is that 90% of the guys that survived the crash or bailout make it back to friendly territory. Uh, I mean, that's an amazing stat. I mean, if yeah. you'd asked me before this show what the percentages were, I'd have, I'd have put the ETO a little bit higher. Yeah. And I'd have put the, 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 the China, I'd have put, oh, I'd have gone, oh, very few got back. You know, you, in your head, you just think distance, different, as you said, they're different factions, warlords, this, that, and the other, language problems, transport problems. It, that's, a, that's an amazing stat. Yeah. And, and what's interesting is that you talk about all these factions and you talk about collaboration, for example. And it turns out that all of these people are on board with helping American air, uh, airmen when they find them uh, all the way down to. And this isn't just guerrilla units. These are like normal, everyday people would encounter these folks who landed in their rice paddy and like get them to guerrillas to get back to friendly territory. Uh, 
And it didn't matter if you landed in communist territory. It didn't matter if you landed in nationalist territory, if you landed in some warlord's territory, or even sometimes if you landed in, in collaborationist territory. There are records of collaborationist troops in occupied Hong Kong, like secretly moving allied airmen out and handing them over to the nationalists, which opens a whole interesting conversation about the nature of collaboration in China uh, and these kind of bad, good dichotomies that we create over notions of collaboration. It also brings up some interesting things when we talk about the contested state of Chinese politics, of the Chinese polity. But what's really interesting is that there's clearly a strong cultural identification as Chinese and therefore this, this uh, strong contestation of Japanese conquest even when the folks don't agree on what should politically be in place of that. Uh, and so you have these interesting little alliances that form over what is seen as an unambiguous good helping American airmen continue the fight against Japan, uh, whether you're a communist, whether you're a nationalist or anything else. Uh, and that was probably the biggest thing about this. Uh, one of the guys that I got to met, Paul Crawford, he went down in communist territory, was rescued by the 8th uh, Root Army, uh, actually <laughs> was brought back uh, to communist headquarters in Yunnan, uh, met Mao Zedong at a breakfast, was then <laughs> like sent back to America. Like, it's just kind of nutty, especially when we look at it from uh, the perspective of now and knowing what we know about the Cold War and, and about our relationship with the, the PRC during most of that Cold War and our attitudes about, about Mao Zedong to think about the fact that uh, we were on the same side of that. There are some people, and in fact, I talk about in the book, a guy was personally walked back to China by Ho Chi Minh. Um, so, so the figurehead of our war in Vietnam, of our enemy in that war, is on our side in World War II, and we're actually providing him with weapons and um, advisors and intelligence agents that are going back with him into uh, Vietnam to fight the Japanese. And, and so it's, it's so interesting seeing all of these relationships at, at the very beginning and then thinking about, uh, maybe some alternatives to what did happen, uh, that, that could have been, uh, but yeah, the, the cast of characters is, is absolutely crazy. Um, What's really interesting is when you look at the geographic distribution of this, it really shows what I was saying earlier that like this spans all of China. This spans like if for the average Chinese person, their experience of World War II uh, was marked by seeing American airplanes fight the Japanese. Uh, there were millions and millions of Chinese that did not see nationalist troops. There were millions and millions of Chinese that didn't see communist guerrillas. There were millions of, of uh, Chinese whose only experience of the war besides Japanese occupation were the American airplanes coming overhead. Uh, what's also interesting is that when you look at where people were captured, you pretty much had to fall on top of a Japanese garrison to, uh, to end up in a, a Japanese prison camp or to end up ex executed by the Japanese, which happened as well. Uh, what's also interesting is that the amount of times that collaborators successfully gave uh, American airmen to the Japanese is minuscule. And one of the reasons for that is retribution. Uh, there's one story in communist territory of a local magistrate who decided, you know, the people brought him this American airman that had been uh, shot down to get him back to friendly lines. He ends up taking the Japanese up on their uh, reward money. He provides this airman to the Japanese. Uh, that airman ends up in a uh, prison camp. And as this guy is walking back to his village with his reward, the village people who are really pissed at him uh, ambush him and kill him. Uh, there's <laughs> there's uh, no mercy for people that sell out to the Japanese uh, in this vein. It's super interesting. Um, and so what that does is kind of creates this enduring legacy that you still see in the fabric all over the Chinese countryside, despite efforts by all parties involved to kind of control the narrative from then on. Um, this is a, a monument that I was able to visit, uh, although the picture is obviously from World War II, uh, dedicated to Bob Mooney in Southwest China. Uh, he was engaged in a dogfight with the 
Japanese fighter over this uh, town of Shangyun. Uh, he shoots down the Japanese fighter, but in turn, his airplane is crippled. The engine seizes, and uh, he has to um, he has to get out. But uh, essentially, as the story is told, he is over this uh, Chinese town, and if he were to bail out right then, this he realizes his plane is going to drop into the town and just kill a bunch of civilians. Uh, so he sticks with it. He stays in the plane until it glides clear of town. And by the time he jumps out, he's only like three or 400 feet above the ground. His parachute doesn't fully deploy. He ends up hitting his head and uh, dying later that night. Uh, for the Chinese people who have just been abused for um, years and years and years by all sorts of people, they're, you know, they're political masters, definitely by the Japanese there's not a great sense in Chinese history that the life of an individual matters all that much. And so this American to come in with this American viewpoint of the value of, of a, of a person, of an individual when he could have bailed out and saved his own life. And I'll tell you what, his airplane could have crashed in the middle of that, middle of that town, killed a hundred people. And they still would have like had a banquet in his honor, thanked him for coming and fighting the Japanese. Um, but by sacrificing himself in their eyes to protect them, these just average Chinese villagers in a small town in the middle of nowhere, it really touched something. And so they actually built this monument to him. Uh, and what's really interesting is during the uh, subsequent communist era, when a lot of monuments like this were destroyed, they actually tore it down themselves and buried the pieces. And so in the 1990s, when it became OK to talk about this history again, they reassembled it. And we're actually able to bring Bob Mooney's sister to the site and, and able to kind of re-honor him and honor his memory. And that monument is now still there today. Uh, and so some of those, uh, some of the memory of it is, is just so powerful. I was telling you uh, at the beginning, I mentioned Pei Hai Ching. I was able to visit him in his home. Um, during the war, he actually deserted from the Nationalist Army during uh, one of the early battles uh, in Southwest China in 1942 as the Japanese were cutting off the Burma Road. Uh, and you can imagine that sort of desperate, confused fighting. There are a lot of people that deserted. And so he ends up kind of becoming a fisherman along the Salween River, which is also the sort of front line uh, for the better part of two years until the Chinese armies start pushing back with American uh, advice and assistance. And one day he's he's there and this uh, P-40 had been shot down by uh, actually wasn't shot down. There was a malfunction. It was dropping bombs on a Japanese encampment on the other side. The bombs go off immediately instead of when they hit the ground. The wing is blown off. The guy bails out Francis Forbes. He lands on the Japanese side of the river, evades for a few days. But finally, he's got to like make a, a push. And so he starts swimming across the Salween River, which is a very rapid uh, dangerous river and Pei Hai Ching. I'm not a tall guy. I'm five ten, So you can see how tall, um, uh, Pei Hai Ching is there. He, he's this, this average height American this is kind of a big guy compared to him struggling in the, the river. And, uh, he doesn't hesitate. He wades in there and, and drags the guy out. Uh, and by the time he drags him out, he's unconscious. He lies there for a few minutes recovering within minutes nationalist soldiers are on the site to to get the guy back to an american air base and so the whole encounter lasts like a few minutes it was really interesting how much of a market left on him uh, and what was interesting is because of this research we were actually able to tell him like hey this is the dude this is the specific individual individual that you saved he went back he had a family he survived the war like what you did was impactful and meaningful. Um, and so uh, that's the kind of memory that still exists in China about this, this relationship that was built. Um, so, so, so tell me, Daniel, this, this almost universal um, uh, desire, maybe isn't the right word, but these Chinese people, whether in nationalist areas, communist areas, whether they're in rural, whether they're in cities, is to naturally help these American pilots. How much of that is is in their culture. I mean, I've, I remember talking to Robert Lyman about some of the areas of Burma. It's, it's, it's culturally, 
you look after strangers. It's one of those things that, you know, you, you see someone who's different to you and you naturally look after them regardless of what you know they're for. So how much of it is that? How much of it is getting the message out that these American volunteers are, are fighting for, for China? Yeah, so uh, it's, it's complicated, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And in fact, one of the interesting things that we see about this is, is despite uh, American views of China, China is not a monocultural, monoethnic place. You know, a lot of these folks are being rescued by different small ethnic groups that are on the, the fringes of traditional Han Chinese society. So there are different cultures that they're interacting with. Uh, what's really interesting is that the majority of these cases that I'm talking about are happening after the Doolittle Raid. And what's crazy about the Doolittle Raid is the reprisals that took place uh, in those provinces where the Doolittle Raiders uh, went down. You know, you're talking something around 200,000 Chinese men, women, and children that were, that were killed uh, in revenge for their assistance to the Doolittle Raiders. And so I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely not something that you can just reduce to culture uh, because the, the costs were so clear. And those costs come through in these individual reports too. You see all the time where the Japanese will come to a, a, a town where that American went down and these Americans are reporting through the guerrillas that helped rescue them. Like, Hey, they say that, you know, a day after, uh, in this place, the Japanese troops came through and they killed, you know, 30 plus people trying to get information about me, uh, and stuff like that. So this is a persistent theme throughout. Uh, so there is this very deliberate, uh, and very intentional resistance that's going on. This is very deliberate and intentional. This isn't something that's casual or just acculturated because uh, the reprisals are so severe. Um, the Japanese have made it very clear what the cost is of collaborating and cooperating with the Americans. Uh, and the Chinese are making it very clear that they don't care, that this is, that that sacrifice is worth it to them, um, which is, uh, which is crazy uh, to, to try and like put yourself in that shoe in those shoes and, and to, to try and think about how you would act with that cost and knowing what some of, you know, the Western European, uh, you know, people that we consider ourselves more, you know, similar to what they did in similar situations, which wasn't 90%, mm -hmm. you know, which was a lot more active collaboration with the enemy. Um, so it, it's interesting to, to try and put yourself in those shoes. Um, Another interesting thing is that it didn't even matter, like like you said, rural, urban. There is a case where P-51 Mustangs are strafing airfields in, in Shanghai. And if you've ever seen the Spielberg movie, um, what is it? Uh, Empire of the Sun. Empire of the Sun uh, portrays one of those raids uh, on the uh, Longhua airfield, which is uh, located right next to a, a prisoner, uh, an internment camp, a civilian internment camp. And, uh, you know, P-51, so pretty vulnerable to ground fire. One guy takes a, a bullet. This is April of 1945, I want to say, or um, sometime in, uh, in the spring of 1945. Takes a bullet through one of his lines, ends up bailing out a mile from one mile from the Japanese airfield that he was strafing. So if you can just imagine this, the Japanese troops that just shot this dude down are standing on this airfield, having just shot him down, watch him bail out of his airplane. They all load up in a truck to go roll him up. By the time they get there, one mile away, he's gone. The Chinese civilians in that area, and we're not talking about an organized guerrilla movement. We're talking about, you know, peasant farmers that live a mile from a Japanese airbase in the heart of Japanese-occupied China basically run up to this guy. They exchange clothing with him so that he's wearing like a, you know, a straw hat and, and uh, peasant garb and sandals. And they put him on the back of an ox cart. And by the time the Japanese show up, he's gone. It takes him two months by ox cart to make it back to American lines. It is not a fast process, but, but they, their response is immediate. Like there's everybody just immediately snaps into action. And these are, this is not, like trained, these are not military people. These are just ordinary folks that are springing into action because they know what the consequences are going to be for that American too, by the way. Mm. Uh, and they are, are seeking to um, 
to prevent that. So yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Um, unfortunately, you know, there's still 400 some odd Americans from these combat missions that are missing in China. Uh, and what's interesting is that I think a lot of them would be, the remains would be recoverable, but unfortunately the politics of the moment kind of prevents that, that sort of working together. Um, I mentioned earlier the, the cases in Thailand, though, and it was kind of a case of a, a door closing, another one opening. My last trip to China was in 2017, and I was really trying to build some relationships with local um, Chinese groups and organizations and, and what we would think of as NGOs to like actually go find some of these folks. And unfortunately, the trade war started literally weeks after I got back, and, and a lot of that effort was kind of undone. But as that door closed, another opened, and uh, I'd been corresponding with the Royal Thai Air Force Museum about a couple of the cases, actually the only two cases uh, that were still missing from Chinese air bases into northern Thailand. Because if you think about that, you know, uh, we think of the bridge on the River Kwai, you know, these Japanese rail lines that are supplying Burma and supplying southern China. Uh, and so a lot of these American airplanes that are based in Southwest China are actually going into Burma, going into Thailand and going into what is now Vietnam and attacking Japanese lines of communication there, which is how we end up having like Ho Chi Minh walking our guys back. Um, and, uh, so a couple of those guys were lost on missions to, uh, Northwest Thailand and there was a flood in Bangkok and the Royal Thai Air Force Museum had to move some records from downstairs to upstairs to save them. And they found a bunch of police reports from the war of local sheriff's departments responding to aircraft crashes. And we were able to correlate a couple of the cases to these two guys that were still missing. And because we were able to take like uh, Frank McKinney here, who's a reconnaissance pilot, single ship mission, you don't have a wingman to see where you went down and to make the report. You know, his route of travel was like over 2000 miles where like, how are you going to figure out where he went down? And you look at his route of travel and it's over Burma and Thailand and over all this rainforest and jungle and everything. But what's really interesting is that that police report takes us to a specific place. Uh, and that specific place takes us uh, through some canvassing to Fong Ma here in the top right, who's 90 something years old and happens to be a witness of his crash. Um, and is able to provide us information on what field he went down in, uh, which then allows the DPAA, the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency, to like go into that field and actually find bits of airplane, even though the, the main parts of the wreckage were removed by the, the Thai sheriff. Uh, there's still little bits of metal there, and they were actually able to find pieces of like bone fragments of him and repatriate him after 70 something years. Um, and another case, uh, Henry Minko, who's a P-51 pilot flying out of Southwest China um, <laughs> and uh, ends up in a dogfight with uh, Thai fighters <laughs> and, uh, and uh, gets shot down in uh, Northwest Thailand in some really rough terrain. And uh, so I was actually able to, to go to the site uh, and uh, you can see me there and then... Um, you can see uh, the 70 year old guide on the far right who had come across the uh, wreckage when he was chasing one of his water buffalo up into the mountains. The DPAA team there is with me. And then behind me with the towel around his neck is uh, Sakpane Promtep, who's uh, a recently retired uh, three star uh, air marshal in the Royal Thai Air Force who just happens to be interested in, in uh, World War II aviation and who at the beginning of my correspondence was the Royal Thai Air Force Museum head he was the director and uh you know this this is 2019 that this picture is taken so this conversation had been going on for seven years between me and him to try and find this guy henry minko and now here we are like with this piece of his airplane up in the mountains very inaccessible that we were able to get to through the fusion of our historical resources it took the uh eyewitness reports uh, I was able to actually interview some pilots that were in this dogfight. I was able to bring out the uh, American reports that talked about him. And then we fused that with the, the Thai police reports and we fused it with the eyewitness accounts. And we were able to actually find this guy through that fusion. And so what's interesting is you have this story of cooperation during the war 
uh, amongst some of these resistance organizations and air forces. Um, and that existed to some extent in Thailand too, even though Thailand was uh, actually uh, sort of allied with Japan, they also had uh, an OSS aligned uh, resistance organization as well um, that happened in Vietnam, that happened in China. And there's this potential for that wartime alliance to turn into cooperation now to kind of be a uh, restorative uh, post-war venture where we find these guys and bring them back and, and are able to uh, kind of have this um, restoration and closure on the backside of it too. And so that was something that was extremely meaningful and, and powerful to me. And I'll just, uh, before we get to the questions here, I'll just leave it with with this. You know, this this history is still rich. This is uh, Zhejiang, which was a U.S. airfield and actually an airfield for the Chinese American Composite Wing, which was a joint Chinese an American uh, fighter and bomber outfit where we were flying side by side, uh, trying to mentor a new Chinese air force into existence. And what's really interesting is that this is now a museum to that effort in the PRC uh, where this history is still a little fraught, right? Um, so that memory is still something that is, is alive there. Uh, what's interesting though, is it is still a contested history. Here's the ambassador to the United States from the PRC putting on a 14th air force jacket but what's interesting is it's missing the CBI patch that has the, uh, the little Republic of China star on it, right? So you have this uh, uh, effort to sort of, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, like redwash the history, mm -hmm. it, which is interesting because, as we talked about, there was communist cooperation with the Americans here. There is a piece of that, that they can latch onto without, like... Uh, taking it away from another entity, if that makes sense. You also have these arguments over who was a real flying tiger, right? Between the American volunteer group and the Army Air Force folks that, that followed them. Uh, you know, here's something signed by Claire Chenault that identifies flying tigers with the U.S. Army Air Forces. So it's clear that he didn't really care. He's a very pragmatic guy. I don't think he really cared about that stuff. Uh, they were they were all the same to him. There's a flying tiger on their patch. So I never understood that controversy. The Chinese refer to all of them as flying tigers, which is kind of why I've adopted that because I'm looking from a cross-cultural perspective. Mm. I'm not looking from kind of a um, U.S. myth-making perspective. I understand the perspectives and I don't, I'm not trying to... Um, put down the ABG uh, because they were the ones that created the myth through their uh, amazing actions. So uh, nothing against them, but I, I do think that some of these categories are bigger than, than some folks have allowed them to. And it just shows the contested nature of this history now. And, and what I think could be some unambiguous good that we could do together with the PRC of finding some of these airmen uh, is still unfortunately fraught. I think it would be, I can't think of a better way to work on our relations than to resurrect this, what was considered an un unambiguous good at the time by both our nations, regardless of the politics, uh, by doing something that I don't see how it could be perceived in any other way than unambiguously good to, uh, to bring back the remains of folks that died in World War II. Uh, and so with that, I will uh, open it up to questions. Well, I mean, brilliant, um, it, extraordinary, and it's it's reminding me that there's never one single view of looking at these things, and and I think those of us who've got into this set of shows with some limited understanding of the war, the show, the, the series of shows have actually just they've they've helped my knowledge, but they've also made it that, that me realise that it is even more complicated than I thought it was, and and yeah. and classifying a country as thinking this way. I mean, the fact you mentioned Thailand, I did a show about Thailand about a year ago and you know the first thing she said was it's complicated it's a very you know and yeah. we're talking about it a lot it's the word it's it's language we use words like neutral or occupied or resistance or collaboration yeah. and they come heavily loaded and actually they normally in, uh, need much more unpacking and quantifying and say okay so what do we mean by this term here um so yeah amazing stuff but we'll we'll do a few questions so um uh what have we got from rick green did this experience have any influence on future SAR policies, procedures, such as in Korea and Vietnam? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things that we see happens, I saw another question there about bloodshits. Um, you, you see this effort to, uh, to create evasion organizations and evasion practices and to brief airmen 
for evasion. Um, and this is something that's happening all over World War II, but uh, some practices, at least from the U.S. perspective, definitely come out of specific experiences in China. And China's unique, too, because unlike in Europe, there's no way that you're going to blend in. Like, all of these are are white dudes. You know, this is not this is a time before real racial integration in, in the U.S. military. Um, so they're, they're not going to blend in with the local population, uh, which makes it much more similar to the kind of, of environments that people were encountering when they bailed out over North Korea or Vietnam. Uh, and so, yeah, the, the bloodshed ended up being really interesting because even though, as, as the uh, questioner pointed out, like a lot of folks were illiterate, it's still the symbolism was immediately apparent. And also a lot of times you'd end up standing there awkwardly. Well, well, the town found their, their one dude that could read or whatever, and he'd come in and tell them what was up. And it wasn't just uh, blood shits. There were also things like pointy talkies that were used that has a phrase in English. And then uh, right next to it is the phrase in Chinese. And then it would also have the phonetic Chinese that you could try and like say it yourself too, if the person was illiterate. And so you could point to the phrase the Chinese characters next to the phrase that you're trying to say. And then the person that's uh, that you're talking to can point at the answer in Chinese characters. You look at the, the words next to it. Uh, Silk of Asian maps were, were used. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, some of those systems end up uh, coming back and recycling into uh, evasion organizations later, for sure. And some of those actual individuals that evaded uh, become experts for building that modern uh, evasion system as well well that makes sense we've done shows about the eighth air force where pilots that had been downed and, and, and were able to get back to our lines then went out and toured u.s bases and, and improved the uh the the, the knowledge of of, of of other crews and say look if you go down do this and we know that some of the british escapers mi9 i think it was started developing the the, the various techniques for here's stuff you'll need when you got get shot down so this idea of of connecting the experience of those who have been on the ground with with the with the training of people who might be shot down in no. the future is, is very interesting um there's another aspect to it too which i think is important to emphasize is that you know we talk about this organic aspect of people naturally helping american airmen uh and what's interesting is that you have uh organizations like agas the uh, air ground aid service that then moves out along those lines that are bringing people in and formalizes some of those things to build networks and formalize some of those networks. So by the end of the war, you have guys that are landing in, in uh, you know, what's now, you know, Vietnam in like the Hanoi area. And they're like uh, talking about getting picked up by an A-gas agent uh, and being run through a rat line that's been formalized. Uh, and so some of, uh, some of those organizational tools and those formal organizations end up building through those efforts as well. Brilliant. Um, David Levine is asking, does Daniel think that the earlier accompl accomplishments by the AVG had an impact on how the later 14th Air Force pilots were treated by the Chinese? So yes and no. Um, what's interesting about the AVG is, yes, definitely impactful, but actually really limited geographically. Uh, they did some stuff in central China, but most of their combat was actually over Burma. And then what combat they did have over China was mostly over southwest China, which was still mostly unoccupied. And so actually, the average Chinese person, when they saw a piece of the American air war, they were seeing U.S. Army Air Force airmen uh, fighting that air war. And so that's why there's that conflation and, and actually lack of understanding by a lot of Chinese people on the difference. Uh, it's really funny. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's a uh, um, Chinese colonel that was an assistant to General Chenault, uh, kind of an inter intermediary for him. And I saw an interview with him and he's like, uh, I don't really understand what the difference is between an American volunteer, wink, wink, and an American serviceman anyways. And I'm like, okay. okay. Uh, and, and so for them, I, you know, it's that distinction doesn't really matter. Uh, but yeah, for the average Chinese person, they were seeing a U.S. Army Air Forces aircraft, not an AVG aircraft um, during the war. You've kind of half covered this, but Bruce Day is asking how effective were the reward silks the pilots wore on their flight suits? What was the Japanese reaction to them? Uh, so the vast majority of Chinese rescuers went unrewarded. Uh, and in fact, uh, there are numerous examples. And if you read the book, uh, it's the vast majority of examples. When the American tries to give a Chinese rescuer money, they refuse to take it. 
uh, most Chinese people. And in fact, there are tons of stories of the Chinese giving the Americans money to help them on their way out of the country. So was there some uh, remuneration? Yes. Uh, sometimes uh, they would ask the Americans to sign a receipt uh, for, for expenses at the end, and then they'd present it to the nationalist government or something like that. But the vast majority of them went uncompensated for it, uh, which is super interesting because when we think about the bloodshed, we think about uh, a reward being offered. That's definitely a part of the, the modern conception of the bloodshed and how it's used by uh, the military. What's interesting about that original bloodshed is it does not mention compensation. It doesn't, it doesn't offer a reward at all. And uh, the vast majority of Chinese did not ask for a reward and did not receive one. Okay, thanks. Ian Carr, uh, were the Japanese using their most modern fighters over China? And if not, did this change with the P-40s introduction? So we're talking about the earlier stage rather than the latter stage. So yes, they were actually. Um, the, uh, and in fact, the American Volunteer Group even uh, encountered some of the uh, prototype Ki-44 Shokai, which was probably one of the Japanese most effective aircraft of the war. And uh, uh, they were encountering also the 64th Sentai, which was probably one of the most proficient Japanese Army Air Force organizations at that point in the war. So, yes, they were fighting the best. Uh, towards the end of the war, the Japanese are introducing Ki-84s to China, the same that they are in uh, in the, uh, the Pacific. So, yeah, uh, it's interesting that uh, Chenault was able to use the P-40 so effectively through his tactical mechanisms and really by pre-positioning his forces. You know, there's this famous encounter between uh, Tex Hill. He's flying a P-51 Mustang on a mission to uh, Hong Kong, and he's bounced by these uh, new type Japanese fighters that shoot down two of his wingmen, uh, who both fortunately managed to come back to friendly territory with the help of the Chinese. But uh, Tex Hill ends up in this dogfight for his life, fighting down to the to the ground level and, and barely escaping in a totally shot up airplane. And he comes back to uh, Chenault and says, they've got a new type of fighter that I don't know if we can beat them in the air. And Chanel just looks at him and he's like, well, Tex, you need to destroy them on the ground then. <laughs> it's just this very pragmatic uh, view of, look, everything has strengths and weaknesses, and we will find the way to attack the Japanese at their weakness. We're not going to attack them at their strength with our weakness. Uh, and so in the early days of the Philippines, for example, the uh, U.S. Army Air Forces lose something like 60 some odd airplanes in the first three days. The entire campaign up through the surrender of Bataan managed to shoot down about 30 Japanese fighters. The American Volunteer Group is actually using an older model of P-40 that has worse performance. They claim something like 299 Japanese airplanes destroyed. And even the most conservative estimates have at least like 115 Japanese aircraft destroyed. And they lose 12 in aerial combat. S same equipment. And that is just the difference of that common sense tactic. Uh, tactical mind that Chenault applies to the problem. Well, that's a, that it's been a perennial uh, subject on World War II TV is the 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 inefficiency of the top Trumps comparison between different aircraft or different tanks. Is that it's about doctrine, it's about training, it's about as we've talked about an entire air defense system. And you know, yeah. I, I, I try and do my bad research. You know, any kind of internet site about the flying tigers always says they were in hopelessly uh, outdated, uh, old-fashioned aircraft. You go, well, kind of, yes, but there's a lot more to it than that. Yeah, and honestly, you know, the P-40 had some advantages on on uh, the Japanese fighters. Uh, it was it was able to dive out of the fight, which gives it some control over the fight. Mm. It was able to absorb more damage. So was it far and away superior like later Allied fighters were? No. But was it like far and away inferior? No. It had some strengths and it had some weaknesses. Um, and so I think, you know, a lot of the history of this air war is much more evenly matched than either side, like reported during the war. Actually, both sides kind of talked about being the underdog in that, in that uh, fight at various points. And actually, really, until late 1944, it's pretty even. Mm. Well, Susan Yu is asking, uh, how accurate were the memoirs that were written in the past and did they reflect the research you did? I mean, you're thinking about that famous Robert Scott, God is my co-pilot book, and this information that did come out back at the time that it was, and people were saying in the show with Aries Lee that that was a book they read as a kid. So, you know, those old books, uh, are, are they kind of outdated now? Uh, yes and no. So one of the things about the books is that they skew towards fighter aces and fighter aces were not a representative sample. Um, 
you know, uh, I don't have the, I don't have the number handy, but, uh, you know, you, you talk about however many thousands, tens of thousands of, of allied airmen that rotated through the war out there. And you talk about a couple score that became fighter aces. So it's not a representative example. Uh, we talked about the fact that most folks that were shot down were shot down by ground fire, which means that more people really engaged in like an air to ground battle than an air to air battle. And so a lot of the uh, books out there have to do with more of that air to air battle, you know, especially when you talk about Scott or Tex Hill. I think probably if you're going to read one uh, memoir is uh, Don Lopez is into the teeth of the tiger. Um, really fantastic and really thoughtful and reflective on the bigger war. But I think by and large, like memoir is never going to be something that is representative of, of a big complex thing like that. You know, um, it's, it's going to tell that one slice of it. You can't have a fully representative memoir, no matter whose it is, no matter how average they are. But I would say by and large, no, there is not a representative memoir of, of that war. Well, that's the, the greater qu uh, question of the reliability of oral testimonies and things like that, which is a massive great can of worms we're open today. But Paul Scott <laughs> is asking, is there any unofficial U.S.-Chinese correspondence that is going on through other channels, countries that provides information on the lost airmen? Um, that is a great question. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of unofficial anything with China. Um it's really interesting because uh, when uh, Chinese government entities deal with the United States, they end up very frustrated sometimes in that the president will say something, but then some governor or a senator will push back and they're like, you can't push back. But the president said, it's like, no, 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 that's like, that's not how America works. We're a mess. <laughs> like um, there's no, there's like this consensus building. There's people at the bottom that have decision authority that can, that can, you know, push back against the president. In China, people are afraid to, to do things, or I don't know if fear is the right word, but kind of leery to do things that don't have sanction from above. Um, and so you can work with folks at the grassroots level, but not much is going to happen unless you have this, this top-down agreement to do something. No, Brian, my, my, well, that's thanks for the answering the question so well, and I think we will bring it to an end in a minute. But my last question for you is, as an American, you know, you're serving in the military, this this whole theater and you know Richard Frank makes the distinction between the Asia Pacific War as opposed to the Sino-Japanese War. Is it an area that is generally misunderstood and and, and underappreciated by your average American and or British World War II buff? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I think you could actually say that all of World War II is generally misunderstood. We do a lot of mythologizing of the war, and what's really interesting is even the military has a mythologized view of World War II, where people kind of pine after this, like, force on force, we know who the enemy is, wouldn't that be great, as opposed to doing counterinsurgency, which is so frustrating. But then you talk to the guys that were there, and they're like, yeah, we lost 26% of the squadron in one day. And you're like, wow, that sucks. That's traumatizing. That, like, I, nobody wants that. Um, and so I, I think, uh, yeah, you, you know, I think something that everybody needs to do is is go back and even reread the stuff that they've read and, and really put themselves in the seat to empathize with the people that are going through this and to like think about the feelings that that people are having is like their entire you know friend group is wiped out in a single mission uh you know i've lost friends but you know you lose one or two friends in the course of a few years and that feels devastating and you think about like man how would that be i can't imagine coming back from a, a, a six-month deployment minus 26% of the squadron coming back from a single mission, like, holy crap. Um, so, uh, you know, that's a way that I think world war two is, is definitely mythologized and sanitized. And, and, you know, you look at these numbers, but you kind of remove the human face from the loss a lot of the times and, and how that must've sucked. And then, then you look at Asia Pacific and China in particular, and a lot of the political connotations that pop up after the war that color how we see things there. So yeah, there's a lot of mythology and misunderstanding. Um, but I, I don't think that it's unique to China, even if it is a little more extreme there. I think it's something that covers the entire war. Well, exactly. And it's, it's you know, you very politely said that I'm trying to do some good stuff here on World War II TV, and we are trying to present things from different points of view and try and try and open our minds up to to looking at the narrative from a different lens, from a different perspective, from the point of view of a different nation, because we are all 
um, victims of the upbringing we had. I, I know I'm still stuck in the British winning World War II because of the comics I read as a kid and the TV yeah. shows and the, and the movies. And it's just trying to embrace the fact that there's always different ways of looking at this. And I feel, I mean, Richard Frank said it, we are on the beginning of a, maybe a, a revolution, evolution of, of, of understanding the Asia Pacific campaign better. I mean, with Normandy, where I live, Market Garden, things like that, maybe there's not much new to say or the same thing said, but via, from a different person. But with this theater, I think there is absolutely new stuff to say. And there are so many voices to bring in the Chinese voice, the Japanese voices, the Indian voices, the, the Thai voices. And I think it'll be, it'll be an exciting era to be in the part of the next stage of historical research. Cause I feel that in the, in 20 years time, there will be a whole new body of work about this that will be going, that, that will be going, wow, that's amazing work. Yeah, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. And, and I appreciate you uh, highlighting this area on your show. Well, thank you very much. Well, we will bring, we'll bring things to an end. So uh, I remind your folks that you can purchase Daniel's book or separate this full and uh, full and tiger is one of them, but there's forgotten squadron is the other one, isn't it? Forgotten squadron and then famine sword and fire is the other one. So, well. you know, your website is in the description below and they can find your books on Amazon and wherever they, they buy books. But thank you very much, Daniel, for joining us. I can't, in fact, I'm now looking for an excuse to bring you back a second time. So the next, the next sign of the Japanese war, will bring you back for another aspect of this. Cause there's, I feel there's a hell of a lot more in your head than what you share with us tonight. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate you having me. Brilliant. Well, this is it then. So this is Paul Burdett from World War II TV saying, I will see you all on Sunday. Cheers, everybody. Thanks for watching. Bye.